Okay. Well, I guess we started a little revolution. The problem was, how do you control weeds in a sustainable agriculture situation or even a sustenance agriculture situation where people have no money? And, and I guess we'll run through the history of biocontrol of weeds. And it took us some 50 years to figure this out. Uh, by us, I mean the whole field of plant pathology. Uh, when I was on a postdoc in Australia, we found that uh, their worst introduced weed was probably Salvation Jane, and two pathogens together would kind of control it. Later, we said the problem with biocontrol is we don't have enough host specific pathogens. So we tried by mutagenesis to do that. Then we uh, worked with sclerotinia, which kills a lot of weeds. And we made some oxytrophic mutants so they would only kill if you sprayed them with a chemical that they required. And then we worked on several uh, fungi that in fact do not overwinter in the cold of Montana. And that seemed to work okay. Our biggest problem was Every plant pathologist I know has probably seen a diseased weed and the disease is usually a fungus or a bacterium or a virus, but generally they don't kill. They have low virulence. Why would a pathogen want to kill its only host? And then in the 90s, we had the war on drugs and we got some funding and we started to get some bio herbicides to actually work. It took uh, a lot of uh, laboratory work and field work. And then uh, that was a little bit dangerous. So we moved instead to Sub-Sahara Africa where their worst weed uh, is really hurting their production and that's Striga and these fungi work. And now in Montana, we're doing the same kind of technology with our local weeds. So here's a rust fungus. And this is what I was saying, fungi, why would they want to kill their only host? So on this island in California, off of California, we found this sort of situation where uh, with the rust, we get a reduction in biomass, but we never get total knockout. We get maybe 40, 50% reduction in biomass versus the wild type. So that is the problem. And that's why most plant pathologists have failed. They assume that if they find a pathogen, it'll work. Fortunately, Steinberg in the 1960s found this very interesting thing that a simple amino acid, like the ones you need in your diet, can also inhibit plants. Nobody knew why, but, and this was basically ignored for 50 years. There's no excuse for that. We scientists should be reading more. But anyway, we found out that this was actually really common. Uh, all these amino acids are regulated. The plant cell is a whole lot like a computer and it has decision gates that it has to go through. So it regulates everything and makes the right amount of everything. And these amino acids that you see in these purple colors here are an example of how things are regulated. You don't want too much lysine or methionine or isoleucine, you want just the right amount, sort of a Goldilocks type situation. Next slide. So how do these things work? And most of you have had a biochemistry course and uh, so you're familiar with this, that there are enzymes up at the top of a pathway and they're called isozymes, like those three different colored enzymes up at the top, just below aspartate. And 
bacteria have all three, but plants being that they control their own internal environment, usually have thrown away a couple. And that gives us a chance. We can often kill a plant with lysine or methionine or threonine because the other two enzymes are missing. So back about 150 years ago, a guy named Boole developed a decision theory and uh, it's heavily used. Boolean gates are the concept or the metaphor we use in computers. And they're amazingly uh, like what goes on in the cell. So we think we understand why certain amino acids can kill a plant. The question is, can we take these out of a factory and actually use this concept in fungi? So here's an example, field bindweed, water hyacinth, houndstone. They're all inhibited by certain amino acids. So once you know which amino acid inhibits a weed, voila, you're, you're halfway there. You just get the fungus to make it. And getting the fungi to make amino acids is a different sort of technical science specialty but it can be done. And in fact, lysine, valine, methionine are actually available at a dollar a pound in animal feeds. So people have learned how to get microbes to make these. Uh, basically what you do is you spread bacteria or fungi on a Petri dish and then in the middle of a dish, you put an anti-amino acid. In other words, something that looks mimicry like an amino acid, but it's toxic. And unless the fungus or bacterium makes a lot of the amino acid, it uh, dies. And you look for mutants that uh, are making a lot of amino acids and they survive. And that's how we basically have developed wild type fungi into really good killers using not toxic toxins like uh, glyphosate or imozapir, but actual amino acids that we actually need in our whole, in our diet. So then we simply use bacteria that require, in this case, valine on the left and we put them in the auger and they indicate that that mutant is making a lot of veiling. And here's an example of what you can do with bacteria when they make veiling. On the left is a hound's tongue plant with some small pim pimples that are due to pseudomonas. But when you get the pseudomonas to make veiling, look what happens on the three plants on the right. So about that time, and we got fairly good at that, along came a government guy with money saying that he didn't really like spraying broad spectrum herbicides all over farms just to knock out illicit drug crops. Uh, could he give us some money and could we develop a technology to actually make bio herbicides work? By the way, there weren't any commercial bio herbicides at the time. So we proceeded with that. And you can see a normal, we call it wild type fungus, isolated from the field, takes six to eight weeks to kill, and it only kills like 25%. But when we get these excreting mutants that make a lot of valine in this case, Look what happens. So we get 90% kill in two weeks, which is about what you get with glyphosate. Next slide. And here is a, a cocaine plant. It's called erythroxylum. And this is what selected fungi can do when you put them in the soil with that plant. So what have we learned? Basically, 
fungi you take from the field are not as virulent as we would like them to be. And secondly, we can make them more virulent by getting them to make amino acids. And we can test them to make sure they're, they aren't producing some bad toxin. And amino acids are not toxic to animals. And the uh, more we can make a pathogen virulent, the less inoculum is needed. So that's our only, that's our real incentive for getting a good virulent pathogen. Often these pathogens stay in the soil for years. So this is a really different model than the normal chemical herbicide model. Secondly, we found that if we can produce farm fresh fungus right on the farm, that is the way to go in terms of economics. And secondly, uh, we have to go and try to wipe out the weed seeds because there's usually quite a few weed seeds in the soil. So sometimes you have to get them to germinate. We do that with uh, methionine production by the fungus causing them to germinate. And of course, you have to understand biology that is that as we know in coronavirus and everything else, weeds will become resistant in time. So you have to have good plant pathologists watching that situation. And then registration, unfortunately, can take years, but maybe it'll be faster uh, once people understand that bioherbicides really can work, but you use different criteria to show that they're safe. And only recently has there been a commercial bioherbicide available, and that's what Claire will talk about. All right, so some of you are probably familiar with Striga. This is little purple flowers called Striga aromantica. And this is a maize crop, uh, Patricia's field in Western Kenya. This farm is similar to ones on 40 million, uh, similar to farmers, farms on 40 million uh, plots across Africa. And it is considered the worst pest threat to food security. If a farm has Striga, it will lose 20 to 100% of their crop yield. Uh, it attacks maize, sorghum, millet, dryland rice, sugarcane, cowpea, wheat. And um, where in those red countries, you can see that's where it's most devastating right now. Um, in Kenya, Western Kenya, where we're working initially, all maize fields are impacted by striga to some degree. Uh, it adds up to about $9 billion in crop loss per year. And this is at the hands of smallholder farmers. This isn't a big ag project uh, problem. Um, smallholder farmers don't have access to inputs um, such as uh, chemical herbicides. So this is, um, they, they've been really overlooked. So this is where we're focusing. 85% of maize farmers are women. So it's also a gender-based food security issue. Uh, you might be aware there are some current interventions uh, weeding and fertilizer and striga resistant seeds are the most common and uh, none of them are attacking the seed bank in the soils. So each striga plant will deposit 50,000 to 500,000 seeds every season. Um, and those, those uh, practices also don't really uh, restore crop yield. For example, striga resistant seeds, we definitely recommend that but they only restore crop yield about 23%. Um, push, push pull is a technology that's been promoted for over a decade. It hasn't been well adopted um, for various reasons. And IR maize is a mazapur resistant maize seeds. Um, they are uh, currently promoted in Kenya, but still hold less than 4% of the market. Um, and they have to be distributed with gloves. So while it's effective, it has a similar effectiveness as ours and a similar price point to our product, um, farmers are a little wary of it because they're not comfortable putting gloves on for what they're considering a, a toxic chemical. 
And then there's FOXY2, which wasn't commercialized. This is basically using Fusarium oxysporum without that virulence enhancement, and it wasn't effective enough to be uh, commercialized. We have to act fast to, to tackle Striga. Uh, within 72 hours of a crop being planted, the seeds, Striga seeds in the soil will uh, germinate due to the hormones put off by that crop. Uh, attaches, sucks, and develops quite quickly. And so this is why we are focused on developing a live inoculum that would also be active immediately. So as he mentioned, we're using Fusarium oxysporum, Formis speciali strigae. Stri uh, Foxy is very host specific. In fact, there are several different kinds of striga. And um, from what we understand at this point, our Foxy strain will only impact two of those three kinds of striga. So it's not even, um, it, it's very host specific. And this is a really key and important part of our innovation. It's not going to be a broad, sped, broad, broad spectrum uh, herbicide, which is what farmers are used to, but uh, we've also seen a lot of challenges with broad sped herbicides. So this is a, a good twist on the innovation. So as we mentioned, we selected the Foxy off of a wilted striga plant in Western Kenya, naturally occurring, it didn't kill enough, but we selected four amino acid excreting strains um, that produced tyrosine, leucine, and methionine. And this was what we were getting our game-changing results with. Here you can see um, that column E, that's what, that was the strain that we selected um, because we were getting um, a much better uh, effectiveness. And you can see on the left there, that's where we conducted trials for five years as we were trying to figure out uh, which of these strains was most effective. And just anecdotally, we haven't done a long-term study on this yet, but in that Kayala Primary School uh, plot that you see there, we conducted trials for five years. And then at the end of those five years, we actually were planting striga seeds and we couldn't get them to germinate. Um, that field hasn't been treated for over six years now, and there's still no striga. So it's persistent in the soil, which is really exciting, promising um, component. In 2013, we got a Gates grant for uh, proof of concept, and we did that on 500 farms over two seasons, which is significant uh, proof of concept trial. And we had almost 100% improvement using our um, treatment in our paired plots. And you can see 56% increase in crop yield in the long rains and 42% in the short rains. This gave us the go ahead to definitely try to commercialize. Uh, part of that was conducting tox and ecotox studies, which were done at Virginia Tech and University of Nairobi and identified no known toxins that are associated with fusaria. Then we had to figure out how to get it out to the farmers. And this is why we have this weird and memorable name, the Toothpick Project. Um, we can grow the fungus onto toothpicks and we're actually using wooden pegs now. Uh, then a farmer at the village level, we train a producer who grows a fresh inoculum by cooking a pot of rice and then transferring it to a sterile bucket. You can sort of see them sitting on that table there during that producer training in uh, Kenya. And they transfer it into that bucket, add the toothpicks or wooden pegs and seal it up and shake it twice a day for three days. And after three days, uh, the farmer can then place a pinch of the inoculated rice with each maize seed and it wipes out their striga. And so this is the process that we're taking to uh, get to scale in Kenya. Our uh, goal is to reach 110,000 farms in the next few years through 100, excuse me, through 850 village inoculum producers, each serving about 125 farmers. Um, and we're doing this through partnerships with organizations like Farm to Market Alliance and Plant Village. Here's sort of our timeline. It's taken a long time. It's 2008 is when uh, the research first started in Kenya. We started our regulatory process in 2015, once we completed that uh, proof of concept trial. And we just got our full registration letter about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, while I was, while I was in Kenya. Um, so it, it took some time, but uh, we're 
We've conducted a lot of field trials. Farmers are really ready and excited to use it. Um, within the first month, we had our provisional registration last March. And within the first month, we were able, even though we had COVID, we were still able to reach 750 farms. And then um, this season, there are two planting seasons in Kenya, we're able to reach almost 2,000 farms. Um, also in this year, we've been working with our spore powder. We've created a spore powder out of our fungal strains and we've coated seeds. We've used a few different methods and we've conducted trials with that. Um, like we mentioned, it's important that it's fast acting because that striga acts so quickly. And we were concerned that a seed coating might not be fast enough, but it's, we've been proven otherwise in the trials and it seems to be quite effective. So that'll add another second distribution uh, channel for us, which is really exciting. We'll be able to then use um, like the AgroVet stores. Um, it's, it'll be a little bit easier for some of the NGOs that we're working with and for the government agencies. Uh, and we also got the UN Best Small Business Award. Um, that was partly because we are not just focused on the innovation and the science, but we're also focused on women farmers and biodiversity and um, uh, climate change, climate crisis, and uh, producing fewer greenhouse gases. So we've uh, kind of bundled a lot of benefits in along with this innovation. And uh, also in 2021, 2022, we're part of an ICGEB grant, which um, I'll get to in a second. Uh, this is our Kenya founding team, and we have some of the top advisors from around the world. And um, beyond Kenya, Striga is a problem across the continent. So uh, because this guy's getting a little bit older, we really needed to make sure that we were expanding and uh, had a better science team trained uh, from around the world and especially across Africa. And so in 2018, we trained scientists from 12 other countries. And um, they it, it's been a little bit slow just because of funding, but we're uh, getting there. Each of these scientists will help uh, conduct trials, lab trials, field trials, and regulatory trials um, as we expand into other countries. In, in Kenya, excuse me, in Africa, every country has their own biocontrol regulation. And so um, this ICGEB grant is to harm, look at harmonization and create guidelines for that. Um, looking globally, we're interested in shifting the entire bioherbicide market, or maybe I should say the entire herbicide market to something that's more biological. Um, the current market's $34 billion annually, and it's almost 100% synthetic herbicides. So um, there's a lot of room for growth and improvement. And it's also a little bit of a perfect storm right now. Um, products like glyphosate, which are uh, glyphosate or Roundup, used to kill everything. And now there are over two dozen plants that are resistant to it. So um, it's a, a major problem, there are consumer concerns. And um, so this is where we can step in and have an alternative solution. This is our science team. We have a couple uh, extra members that aren't pictured here where we have two, whoops, we have two scientists from a couple countries. Uh, Dr. Christopher Sue is part of the collaborative research program with ICGEB. He was just in Kenya training with Henry Seelan Nazoki who's our lead scientist who's been working on this project since 2008. And then we also brought down our scientists from Ethiopia um, to all do collaborative research. And um, they spent a week in the lab together, which was quite beneficial, although not quite enough time. So we're going to hope to repeat it and then bring in more of these scientists uh, for uh, additional trainings and collaboration over the next couple of years. Uh, we, we've been held back a little bit by not having that registration in Kenya. So now that we have that, things are kind of going gangbusters and um, it's exciting to try to keep up. This is the harmonization grant that uh, the Standards and Trade Development Facilities put together uh, or funded for ICGEB. And basically it's to create a guidelines for um, the South African Development Committee member states for how they can uh, harmonize their regula regulations. So the toothpick project was selected as the case study 
and we're part of the project advisory board and we'll be using the draft guidelines to utilize as a live practice and simulation of the harmonization guidelines. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, we're really excited about that because that will hopefully expedite uh, our innovation so that we can get it to more farmers more quickly. And so why biocontrol? There are, uh, we, I mean, we can talk about this a little bit together. There are pros and cons. Um, go for the cons. Okay. The cons are that uh, the current herbicide industry is based on broad spectrum herbicides. They kill anything green or at least a major group of plants, but biocontrol has to be host specific. You can't afford to release a pathogen that's going to kill somebody's tomatoes or something. Uh, so far, though, efforts have been very weak, very few successes. So there's not really a public awareness of how to handle this. Thirdly, a uh, chemical market is huge and very powerful. And many of the rules around registration are based on chemical analysis. And that's quite different from biologicals. Secondly, or lastly, uh, our intellectual property is a little bit difficult to protect because these are natural pathogens found out there. So Claire can do the pros. All right, well, um, it, it's safe. Uh, it's, it's host specific. That's a key component that's designed within the, the innovation. Um, we know amino acids inhibit all plants. So uh, because fusariums are our fungus of choice, our agent of choice, um, our opportunity is to simply find the fusarium for each plant that we're trying to inhibit. Um, synthetic chemical herbicides are being increasingly prohibited in the EU. Uh, it's quite inexpensive to manufacture this. And uh, another benefit is that we're able to produce this without having to ship anything from overseas. We, we can create this product at the village level and it drives the economy at the village level. Um, there's less weed resistance. Um, this also can tie into some of the climate climate impacts that we're seeing. Um, you know, if you're just using a, a chemical recipe that's been used over and over for the last 40 years, you're not going to see it fluctuate with climate. And so a biological will have that as a benefit. There could be some cons there too, but so far we're seeing the benefits of that. Um, and pretty low development costs as well. Uh, we have this hunch, as I mentioned earlier, that is persistent in soil. We haven't done a long-term study on that yet, but um, that definitely seems to be the case. So we'll be evaluating that as we proceed over the next few years. And um, they're not on this list, but something else that's interesting to explore is the other benefits that we could do as a combination. Um, for example, what if our fusarium inhibits another bad fusarium. For example, cow pea has a fusarium that attacks it. Um, it's specific to cow pea. What if our fusarium forma specialis strigae can actually over, overpower that other fusarium? So this is, this is room, there's so much room for development here, um, but it's pretty exciting. And it also can work with other biostimulants. So that's um, a benefit as well. We've had a lot of traction. We've, we're really excited about our partnerships. Um, we're working, you know, as I mentioned, in these other countries. I'll name them off in case you didn't catch them on that map. Uh, we have Sudan. We have a postdoctorate uh, working at Montana State University. I'm actually going to go back to this slide so you can see. Um, Dr. El Haj is uh, doing her postdoc at Montana State University right now. Julia Saramaga in Uganda. Uh, we have two scientists in Tanzania. In Ethiopia, we have two scientists, uh, and they're currently being funded by the UNDP, which is probably uh, going to send them to the lead as far as our next country for development. Uh, Dr. Akello is with IITA in Zambia, and she's worked on commercial applications for AFLASAFE. Um, 
Dr. Shayana Wako from Zimbabwe is working in South Africa uh, and he's part of the ICGEB collaborative, or excuse me, the harmonization grants. Uh, we have a researcher in Nigeria, Benin, Ghana, Mali, and Cote d'Ivoire. And currently our scientist in Cote d'Ivoire is actually in Ghana as the director of Wascal. So uh, as far as looking at West Africa, Ghana could be a very um, advantageous place for us to launch. And then of course we have Dr. Sue in Cameroon, who's doing some really great work and he has an expertise on substrate development. So we have an excellent team. We're always looking for more. Um, we will be holding a stakeholders meeting as we um, develop a plan for Ethiopia and that'll be in January. If anyone would like to attend, please shoot me an email, claire at toothpickproject.org or you can send a message to davidsands41 at Yahoo and um, we'll definitely invite you to attend that. And uh, we're open for Q&A. 